Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to another season of the Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. I'm your host, Brad Dotto, with my co host, Michael Bird. Thanks, Brad. You made it to season nine. You've aged a bit since this started, but I'm sure you feel better than you look. I feel great, and for that's a low blow. And any aging I'm revealing right now is a natural consequences to being a partner with you and having to sit across from him during this podcast. Oof, as my kids would say, you burn me back. Um, speaking of age, Brad, our podcast is celebrating a big birthday today. I know. Happy 100 audience members who are watching us. You can see. These beautiful balloons behind our heads right now. We have a, have a cake sitting in front of us, an upgrade to our studio, all for the 100th episode. And if you feel an amp up in energy, you'll know it's from the sugar if I start eating this cake while we're recording. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt. Well, I mean, yes, we're kicking off the season nine with the 100th episode. It's been an amazing, almost four-year journey since we first discussed having a podcast Brad, what do you remember about how it started? Yeah, I mean, the greatest part is that we've referenced it and had this gentleman on uh, on our show before, but Tim Sawyer was sitting there talking to us. He said, you guys are dynamic speakers. It's uh, I love the way y'all tell stories. Y'all need to start a podcast. And I remember us like, yeah, that sounds great. And we had to do a deep dive on, on and maybe that's because we're attorneys or maybe just because we're so analytical. We spent a lot of time really going through that process of, trying to figure out what does that podcast look like? How should it feel? How do you put it on a podcast? How do you get the equipment? How do you find people like Riley? I mean, all the things that uh, we started going through, you know, knowing we had this background in speaking, but turning it into trying to podcast. And like so many things that have happened in our careers, our biggest vision did not have a room like this no, for our 100th episode with no, a cake. No, the yeah, cake, that's true. It's amazing. I, well, I think about our first experience recording an episode, and we were so excited. We're in this room. It yes. look, didn't look anything Nothing. like this. Yeah. But we started recording, and we both felt like fish out of water. Mm -hmm. We had, as we mentioned, lectured for years at conferences, yet this just required a different muscle group. I don't think either of us anticipated it, and uh, and you know, basically we ended up trashing our first recording and starting over. Yeah, Mike, you should probably shouldn't have told them that we had to do a redo, but we definitely had to take a, a mulligan on that very first one. But good news is, audience, we did save it. It will be sold as an NFT. Bidding will start now. Yeah, if there's ever a time where they make us pay to give it away, this that, that first recording might be it. Uh, seriously, though, I know... Uh, this is cliche, but there, I just have so many great memories of the recording process. Yeah, we've had these amazing guests. We've had some fun stories. And there's so many different um, behind the scene moments. Uh, there are moments where you could and I could hold it together because we're laughing so hard internally. Yeah, I mean, we're constantly trying to say something just immature enough to get the other person derailed. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a few episodes where I cracked myself up trying to crack you up and I could barely hold it together the rest of the time that we were recording. Um, but I don't know. What about you, Brad? Do you have a favorite memory or proudest parent moment of our podcast? I mean, favorite memory. There's so many uh, too close for me to even narrow it down to one. Um, but, you know, being the parent side of it, what's been amazing is when we finish recording an episode, um, we think it sounds great normally, except the one that we trashed, but unlike like a, a public speech where you're there in person and you get the immediate gratitude of people lining up to talk to you, when we record a podcast, it may take weeks, months, um, even before we get any feedback from the audience. And luckily for our, us, we have an awesome audience. Y'all been giving us some amazing feedback. And so I'm proud that we found a platform for us to continue to be ourselves, but better and different, and still find a way to educate others. How about you, Michael? Yeah, well, the being ourselves part is true. I mean, the uh, us trying to derail each other is pretty much our daily life. Yes. So, uh, but I I love it every time I meet someone in person that says they're a fan of our podcast. It feels so real. You know, we see the numbers and are blown away when we hear the statistics on the number of downloads from our listeners. 
it just doesn't feel as real. It's just like it's almost surreal when you see that. But when I'm talking to an actual human who says they love our show, it's just it's a really cool experience. Yeah. And you and I both had these great moments where we have spoken to someone who's a potential client and they mention how much they enjoy our podcast. And but I think for me, Michael, some of the cooler moments when we've had long existing clients of ours who've been in the industry for a long period of time, they end up telling us, Hey, I listened to your show and I got so much valuable information. And I guess from my perspective, it's like, wow, you're in this industry. I didn't think I could teach you anything new and that you're getting stuff from our show is great. But I also love about it is, and you and I both had this conversation with others, is people who are just getting into the industry, you know, the first time person to a long time serial entrepreneur, they've all said they've enjoyed different aspects of the show. And really, Brad, we can't reflect uh, without talking about our show's North Star, our stabilizing force. Yeah. No, Brad. No, no. Our producer, Riley. Yes. Also known as the most positive, joyful person we know. She's handled all kind of crazy technical difficulties in the middle of recording um, and has kept us really calm. In fact, audience members behind the scene, we've had some technical difficulties and you don't even know it yet um, because she's always calm, always smile, and just amazing. So, Riley. We want you to jump on with us, get on air on the other side and talk with us just for a minute about your experiences uh, with producing the show. Well, thank you. Um, you guys know my face is already turning red uh, from the true. attention. Yes. So but thank you. It's the best time I'm sure our audience can imagine, but we truly have the best time recording the show every week. We're constantly laughing and definitely have our fair share of blooper reels. <laughs> This is true. <laughs> <laughs> but it really is so fun to hear from all of you. So if you love the podcast, please let us know. We really love hearing from all of you. And I don't want to put you on the spot, Riley, but talk a little bit about why you think I'm better than Brad at recording. Um, I'm sorry, Riley. Don't You don't have to answer that. I know how hard it would be for you to tell him he, he is not. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a dollar for every time I heard that. <laughs> but Michael so and Brad, congratulations on 100 episodes. Thank well, you. thank you, and thank you for being part of almost 900 of them, it seems like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that was fun. It's time to get to work, Brad. Right. As a business and healthcare law firm, we represent clients in multiple sectors and multiple specialties, especially healthcare. Wait, cut, cut, cut. Michael, this is season nine. You're going on the opening of season eight. Well, now you're acting like one of my kids with the interrupting, Brad. Hang with me. Well, let's try this again. Just bear with me. Okay? All right. Okay. As a business and healthcare law firm, we represent clients in multiple sectors and multiple specialties, especially healthcare. This season, our theme is Specialty Spotlight, where each episode will visit about some of the nuances that can be found from a business and healthcare perspective in the various practice specialties. If we are going to shine the spotlight on a specialty, I think it's time for me to open the closet door and shine the light on the specialties in high school for you, Michael. It was referenced last season on another show, but you know, audience members, you all know this, Michael loves context. Don't do it, Brad. Oh yeah, we're going there. Yes, audience, Michael was known, at least by a few people, as the captain of the tennis team in high school. But his real calling audience members was typing. I wish I could deny this. So my understanding, now this is coming from a, a good mutual friend of ours, um, a guy named Oliver Christ, who's a classmate of Michael's in high school, and that Michael went to state for typing. What does that even mean, Michael? I grew up in Texas, Brad, okay. and they actually had typing competitions that measured you on speed and accuracy. You would advance just like other sports. Well, I guess you'd call it a sport. <laughs> <laughs> to district, regionals, and then state. All right. First off, was it one of those old typewriters that made all the clicking sounds at the end of each page? You had to hit that cartridge return and ching, and it go all the way back and you have to start all over the next time? Was there any other kind of typewriter? <laughs> yes, it was. All right. Second, does one get? Um, how does one get into competitive typing? Did you go to like that typing camp or have a type private typing coach? And did that coach start yelling at you to like have quick fingers, quick fingers, quick, 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 quick? Or you have like special finger stretching things that you did for you know preparing for typing? I think you're starting to bully me a little bit, Brad. <laughs> okay, 
once and for all, I will share the real story about how all, it all went down. But you can't, it's just between us, okay? Okay, well, don't be distracted by Riley and I laughing hysterically as you tell the story. <sighs> okay, so once upon a time, a long time ago, this is the 1980s, I was in typing with Miss Self at my high school in 10th grade. Typing was an elective back when they still used typewriters, as I said, back in the in the 1980s. This is about 1986. So I can just see little Michael sitting there with his typewriter banging away in his old typewriter. Oh yeah, and so I get into this class and we're doing the things you do at the beginning of typing, learning the basic skills and Figure yeah. positions? Yeah, and we're, you know, <laughs> ha they put up a line and we have to try to type it, you know, it was on the, you know, the little AV thing that they put on the wall and you're having to like basically copy it. And Miss Self must have noticed something special, Brad. Oh, yeah, I bet she did. She walked by and she pulled me and two other people aside and said that there was a such thing as competitive typing and that she thought that that, that would be something that we would all be really good at and so for the rest of that semester when i showed up to class every day they handed me a walkman do you remember what that is well guess what are, um thanks to stranger things which is a tv show that uh, almost everyone including my kids are watching people now have recently learned what a walkman is okay so i would get and you know, have a cassette tape and i would go into the corner in a typewriter and would practice all I would be practicing was speed and accuracy all day. And I got free 100s on all the stuff, like learning how to write a letter and all the stuff you learn in typing. I just got an auto 100 for it. That was actually probably the best thing about the class, about my competitive career <laughs> in typing. And if you don't, if you don't believe me, one of our friends, Robin Pugh, who we've met, uh, we've referenced on the show and had on as a guest, his wife, Karen, was in Miss Self's class with me. And she witnessed it all firsthand, including the moment that I got pulled aside and tapped to go into competitive typing. This person, Miss Self, it kind of sounds more like a made-up person's name, like that girlfriend you had in high school from Niagara Falls. Do you really mean myself was the teacher? First of all, Brad, we agreed we weren't going to talk about Niagara Falls uh -huh. and girlfriends anymore. Miss Self was the real deal. Okay. This all really happened. Look. We're talking about this because uh, one of our mutual buddies ratted me out. I was perfectly content with this being Thank you, Oliver. in the closet. All right. Well, now that we fast forward since this was in the 80s, and for those keeping track, Michael 700, how are your typing skills today? Sadly, I'm not the same. I mean, don't get me wrong. Is I'm faster than you. You don't wear a Walkman anymore? It, that, and I don't type that much anymore. But other than thumb typing, which was not a thing back then. But... Uh, I'm not in competition game shape with my current talking skills. <laughs> <laughs> well, good thing for our audience to know is there's nothing in my life to be embarrassed about. Oh, Brad. Bradford, yes, you do. The audience needs to know that you're a specialist when it comes to gaming. And not any type of gaming. Role-playing games. Or RPG, as they call it on the streets. You know, Michael, this is our 100th episode, and our audience really wants us to get on with the show today. So let's move on uh, and, and keep going um, to where we're supposed to go next. No, no. I, you know, this, Brad, is too important because this is when you and I were young friends and just learning the art of giving each other a hard time. Yes. And uh, I remember distinctly it being in your office at our old firm yeah. talking and Marcus, our IT guy, walking in and throwing a paper hand grenade into your office and uh, the conversation that ensued between the two of you was like a uh, foreign language. I was like, what is happening right now? And I cannot wait to capitalize on this moment and torture you. <laughs> Little did I know it, wait, you'd have to wait like a, over a decade <laughs> for the, to capitalize in a podcast. But let's take even a bigger step back from context perspective. My dad was a gadget guy. And I remember the first computer console we ever had was Pong. Uh -huh. And and it was that, you know, whoop, whoop. Oh, yeah. Whoop. And so then we got the Atari. Uh, then we got the next upgrade, the next upgrade. So I got bit pretty early on all these different types of uh, games that are out there. So all the different consoles that have come through us. I've always enjoyed it as a, a good way to have some mind-numbing downtime. 
um, just as, you know, as a doctor might order. And so uh, that's been the fun part from from my uh, downtime moments. And what was your game? I don't know if I have a game anymore. Uh -huh. um, it's been a while, so I can say that it's been a uh, a game that's really stood out to me. But because they're strategic games, they're like chess, but they're they're more. Um, and there's first person game. So Marcus that day was talking about Halo. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, but uh, I think it's time to move on. I think we both lost and may have overshared, Brad. <laughs> I think I hope our audience sticking with us and still loves us. Yeah, and I think, you know, there could be an entire episode on gaming, which you would die over, and an entire episode on movies, which are, um, you might die over too. So I think uh, we'll move on to what we're here for today. Yeah, and season eight was another guest-heavy season, and I don't know if you remember, Brad, we interviewed each other in our opening episode. Yes, Michael, I was there, and everyone knows, again, I was the best guest on the show that day. We're going to do the same thing this season, Brad, except with a twist. We're going to interview each other about our father's practice specialties and spend some time highlighting the differences the various specialties face and how this affects them in business and healthcare compliance. So I want to point out to the audience first off that we have this technic technicality that we are not our first guests um, for the opening of this season. So I like the way we're already starting with season nine, um, that we're just channeling our inner dads from their perspective uh, so that we can really talk about their specialties. So again, we're not guests, we're channeling, channeling our dads. So let's start with channeling your dad. Tell us about your dad's specialty. So my dad uh, was a plastic surgeon. He uh, had kind of a couple of different areas of focus and it evolved over the years, but essentially for the most of his career, um, he had, was an adult cosmetic surgeon and a pediatric craniofacial surgeon. Pediatric craniofacial surgeon operated on kids, primarily with cleft lips and cleft palates. And then the adult cosmetic side was mostly elective mm -hmm. uh, cosmetic surgery. Um, and it's important if you're talking about the specialty of plastic surgery to, to just appreciate that there are so many different subspecialties that those are just two. There's uh, micro, there is hand, there's adult, other adult reconstructive surgery, and then there's facial focused cosmetic surgery or body focused uh, cosmetic surgery. You know, and Michael, um, for our audience who does not know, his dad is one of my favorite birds of all time. In fact, I have him ranked number two because his sister Meredith is my favorite bird of all time. Um, and then his nieces are currently, Michael's nieces are working for us right now, so they might rank ahead of Michael. But for those who don't know Steve Bird, he's a, a great gentleman and a, a really fantastic surgeon, but a great human being on top of that. Um, but, uh, you know, switching to my dad, my dad being an orthopedic surgeon, um, he was, um, he would had his fellowship in hand, so that was his focus. He would, as the audience knows, we were based out of New Orleans, um, and so he started a, many different clinics there. One was called the Louisiana Clinic, another was called the New Orleans Orthopedic Clinic. Um, and over the years, um, his focus was always on sports medicine. That was his specialty. But like all orthopedics, he had worked on different aspects. There are a lot of subspecialties now that are more focused than they used to be, but bones and joints and ligaments and tendons and muscles can all be broken up into different areas, some of them are actually even spine. Um, but for my dad, um, he really enjoyed every aspect of it, again, focused on the hand, but near the end, just doing some knee scopes. But I think one of the biggest kicks he got out of being an orthopedic surgeon, he ended up being a second opinion for the NFL. So a lot of times when someone wanted another doctor to look at him, they would fly into New Orleans and I yeah, got to see them. And I'll just pause for a little bit of a proud son moment. I, I don't think we spend enough time acknowledging uh, how big of a deal both of our dads were in their respective specialties and uh, what an amazing part of being healthcare attorneys that's been for us because we've seen it and experienced it in ways that we wouldn't have when we've had other doctors come up and talk to us about you know something they learned from from one of our fathers is really cool um tell me brad next question what are the biggest patient challenges in your father's specialty you know, I'd say for them, and it's just, just in general, is that when they're doing trauma coverage and trauma patients, I mean, those are the hard ones. Uh, a, a lot of, my dad always called it the young man sport. We have call coverage and you're dealing with trauma patients. So a trauma could be, you know, obviously a sports injury, 
or trauma could be with a car incident where someone breaks their shoulder or ankle or worse. And then, you know, trying to deal with those expectations of those trauma situations with those patients. Well, you know, we could go into payers, but I don't think that we really have to heavily go into that. But that is a, an aspect. But trauma patients are the, the hardest ones to deal with because of the uh, impact it has on an individual hurt at the job, hurt in a car, or hurt playing, you know, a sport. Yeah, I'm guessing like if you have a gunshot wound that it doesn't feel very good, you're not going to be very happy with your doctor yeah. um, if they can't take that pain yeah. away. And you know, and you think about it, most of the time when it comes to orthopedic, it's not elective in the sense of like, oh, I want to get the surgery. It's some, something bad happened to that patient and put them in a bad situation, especially on the trauma side. Right. Um, and so it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's, I can just kind of jump off of there, Brad, because in plastics, especially in, in cosmetics, it's an elective mm -hmm. procedure. And so you're managing expectations from a different front. You have uh, clients that are choosing to be operated on and they're carrying expectations about what they want to expect to look like from the surgery. And so there's a real discipline in making sure you're aligned with the patient on expectations that they're a good match for surgery. There's a lot of mental health issues that you have to learn how to kind of identify and flag so that you are you know, doing the right thing by a patient with the, what they're asking for. And then, you know, even on the pediatric cranial facial side, those kids are patients throughout their childhood. They you oftentimes are having multiple surgeries from the time they're infants until they're teenagers and there's integrated care with other specialists and so uh, there's amazing bonds that are formed with there but there's also kind of unique challenges that go with that kind of a, a journey with the patient and with the patient's family absolutely so talk about from a business perspective, Brad, kind of the uh, biggest business challenges in your father's specialty? You know, for orthopedists, there are a lot, but I think for a lot of orthos, they're really, for them to grow their practice, they want to concentrate on what type of ancillaries can they touch on behalf of their patients? What are, what are the ways they can extend their service line? And so obviously in most orthopedic practices, you might go in and there'll be an x-ray machine so they can obviously x-ray your bones. Um, larger groups might have a CT or MRI machine, so they'll have all those imaging aspects of it. So from a growth perspective, um, the patient doesn't have to go somewhere else. It can all be handled in-house. And then as you grow as an organization, depending on your patient mix, you might even have labs or um, post-surgery, you might have physical therapy or to do a, a, a day surgery, you might have an ambulatory surgery center, which I know we'll talk a lot more with the guests later this season. All those are different ways for them to look at ways to um, with their focus and their specialty of, of finding other means of revenue, but more importantly, ways of controlling the patient care by keeping it inside of your practice. Yeah, when we talk about ancillaries, as Brad just as mentioned, I mean, these are things that are not part of the normal care, like the, the physician providing surgery. Sure. And so, uh, you know, most specialties have ancillaries that are, that are typically associated with them. Um, in plastic surgery, for example, you hear medical spas yeah. are a common ancillary uh, business to the plastics. And there's some challenges that go with that and opportunities uh, because there's uh, a different type of staffing, a different approach when you're dealing with non-invasive side of medicine versus the invasive side of medicine. And then, you know, surgery centers are common. You, you mentioned that in the uh, in orthopedics and plastics. It's also uh, a common opportunity, but it's a challenge because the view of the business people and the view of the hospitals are typically that plastic surgeons are not, quote, profitable in a surgery center yeah. because of the amount of time it takes uh, for a, a typical you know, plastic surgery uh, procedure. Um, and then just some other business challenges on the craniofacial side. Uh, you know, they're, they're so integrated with the hospital relationship that there's issues about whether they're going to be kind of part of the hospital's employees or a service line where they have a contract to service yeah. patients of a hospital. And, uh, and then, you know, on the cosmetic side, your partners, your business partners are also your competitors. So yeah. there's some unique challenges on that front. No doubt about that piece. So let's switch one more question, uh, Michael. Um, and again, focusing on our dad's practices. 
Tell us about the biggest healthcare compliance challenges for your father's specialty. So for plastic surgery, um, scope of practice issues, I mentioned the medical spa, yeah. um, the corporate practice of medicine, which we've talked about a ton on this show, yeah. because there's a lot of opportunities in plastic surgery to partner with non-doctors. Uh, supervision and delegation of other providers is a big uh, kind of challenge and topic. And then on the reconstructive side, there's a lot oftentimes out of network, in network, insurance related challenges. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, most of those audience members you can imagine can also somewhat roll into the orthopedic side, obviously, except for the med spa piece. Um, but, you know, for orthopedics, because the uh, vast majority, well, a heavy amount of orthopedic practices have a lot of Medicare patients, such as very normal because of aging and hip replacements and people falling down, right? Going back to trauma. And because of that, they need to be very well aware there are certain regulations that um, they have to be familiar with. They have to be familiar with certain federal laws. And most of the time people hear physician self-referral law or also named as Stark law or the uh, federal anti-kickback statute. Those would be the ones we've talked about in other shows, but it feels like in orthopedics, it's hard to have a conversation with anyone in that specialty without those two rules coming to play in some perspective. All right. Good stuff. Let's go into commercial, Brad, and on the other side, we can talk about some uh, kind of legal wrap up from our discussion today. Many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success. Why? For most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team, so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. Welcome back to the 100th episode. That's right, the 100th episode of the Legal 123's The Bird Adato. I'm your host, Brad Out, still here with my awesome co-host, Michael Bird. Oh, shoot, Riley Cut, awesome. No one really wants to believe that. Michael, this speaks... We've, this season, the theme is specialty spotlight. We had a lot of fun really just opening up about our father's specialties and really talk, kind of having a deep dive and understanding what they go through on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, and hearing from you on your dad's perspective of really understanding from a plastic surgery, there, there are a lot of similarities between that and orthopedic practice, and there's so many things that are so different. And so, you know, we, you you and I were talking before this show, like, oh, well, that's similar, that's similar, that's so different. And like, okay, yeah, they're both surgeons, right? That's similar. And they both have to deal with sometimes, um, you know, as you know, with uh, a, a surgeon, they may have some trauma, people have been burned or, or injured, so the orthopedist might be rebuilding the injury that happened before that, and then the, the plastic surgeon comes in afterwards. But um, what are some of your observations just in general on today's show between the orthopedic side or our dad's specialties it's just in general? Well, it, it shows, I think we can illustrate really easily how important it is to understand the nuances from a business and healthcare perspective that go into a specialty. So let's, orthopedics and plastics actually meet each other at a certain point. There are hand specialists that work together, orthopedic hand specialists and plastic surgery hand specialists. Yeah. And so those, those two specialties end up having extremely similar issues yeah. if you're reviewing you know, contracts for an orthopedic hand specialist and a plastic surgery hand specialist. Sure. And then you take it all the way into you know, one's dealing with patients that have experienced some trauma and the other kids experiencing elective medicine uh, type stuff. Uh, but understanding that they, again, even there, they both have ancillary businesses yeah. and sometimes the same ancillaries, but with different issues. So, um, you know, uh, orthopedics tends to have heavy federal regulatory implications because of the types of payers that are involved yes. with their procedures and, uh, and the types of services that are, that are involved, the types of ancillaries. Yeah. And, uh, and so, it, it just is uh, kind of a great illustration from my perspective on how much difference it can make on the advice we give someone, just depending on where they are from a specialty perspective. Yeah, and I can give the easy example we've talked about in other episodes, but you know, when it comes to surgeries, 
orthopedics are proud to get somebody up and walking again or whatever the injury may be, right? While with plastics, they're so proud of it, they'll do a before and after. I don't think I've ever seen good before and after pictures of someone, you know, replacing their knee um, and, and looking at the before and after knee shots. Because why? It's gross. It's a giant scar across your knee. Well, we've seen them in the presentations, Brad, <laughs> yes, we to other doctors, and we were not the audience intended, <laughs> no. and it, we didn't handle it well. <laughs> no, we didn't. <laughs> So any other final thoughts for today, Brad? You know what? My my biggest takeaway for today's show is we have this awesome team, audience members who put together this great surprise for us because we were surprised to walk in and see our 100th episode balloons, this cool cake that I probably eat half of in about two seconds. I'm very thankful off camera, everyone, for Riley and the rest of the team that makes this go. Um, we could not do that without them. Um, and, you know, shout out to all, all the, the Birdell uh, team members who've helped us make our 100th episode. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I'll, I'm going to type a thank you. It'll be much faster than you can type it. And uh, I'm going to just dust those skills off. <laughs> all right, audience. Guess what? Next Wednesday show, we will actually have guests that aren't Michael and I. Specialty Spotlight will be on our orthopedic surgeon, who's also a team doctor, the best NFL team out there. Green Mayor will be joining us. Bertadato is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Bertadato. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.